welcome everyone. Uh, today we have a very special guest, Kostas Lapavitsas, who is talking to us about um, a recent pamphlet, The Cost of Living Crisis, and uh, the topic of inflation from his uh, new book, The State of Capitalism. Uh, Gosta, thank you for coming. Uh, could you, just to start, uh, summarize uh, for us your uh, your thoughts about uh, the recent uh, issue of inflation and um, and the 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 books that you that you wrote? Yeah, I will. Thank you very thank you very much for the invitation. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, talk to socialists and activists in the United States and find common language and uh, common aims. Uh, it's very, very important. Um, I will discuss inflation. You've seen the short pamphlet that I produced with a couple of uh, colleagues of mine here in, the, in Britain. But I will also put it in the context of the bigger book that uh, you know we've produced, The State of Capitalism, uh, because obviously the two works are closely connected. Um, I can start with inflation, summarize it, rather, my position in inflation or our position in inflation, and then I'll tell you about the uh, uh, the book itself, which gives you a broader context. Um, our take on inflation is straightforward. The real problem, what has caused uh, the cost of living crisis, um, is basically the problems of what we might call the supply side, the problems of production. It isn't, it's not really demand that's the issue here. It's not really quantities of money that is the issue here. The real problem is the supply side, the, the sustained difficulty of the production side, um, or the inability of capital to accumulate um, successfully and dynamically in the ways that um, it has done in the past. That's where the problem starts. And that's what inflation um, conveys. Um, related to that is the extraordinary power of the um, modern state. Um, contemporary capitalism, despite all the talk about markets versus state and all this, depends on the state, depends crucially on the state. Um, and the modern state is fundamental and very powerful in one key way. It creates money. It creates Fiat money it creates vast amounts um, of money. That's where its where its power comes from. I'll have an opportunity to discuss that uh, as we move along. And that is also connected to inflation, not through what is called the quantity theory of money. In other words, there's too much money chasing too few goods. No, not in that way. But um, the money that the state creates allows the state to intervene in the economy, allows the state to create demand, allows the state to push. Um, aggregate demand in certain ways, when supply doesn't respond because profitability is not high, because capitalism malfunctions, then you end up with inflation. And what happens there is that uh, some parts of society make profits and some parts of society make losses. And the parts that make the profits, you don't need me to tell you, are basically the capitalist part. The part that make losses are the workers. The inflation that we've been through and will continue to go through uh, reflects these bigger movements that I mentioned, the economic movements. But the bottom line is it stands for an income transfer. Basically, money comes out of the pockets of working people. Their real wages decline. Their ability to buy the things that they need for themselves and their families declines. Their purchasing power declines as a result. And that loss becomes company profit. It's not an accident that company profits increased substantially in the early parts of this decade, because of course that, that's what was happening. It's an income transfer. Um, I say that I say that, and it's very important because usually when we think of capitalist economies, the ideology and the standard economics is that capitalists make profits because they're risk takers, because they invest because they they create the future you know that's the that's the the standards uh, uh, ideological uh, path on this um and because they do so they get remunerated and they make profits uh 
Yes, very nice theory. Except that in the last few years, that's not at all what has happened. Uh, it's not because of um, growth of investment and dynamic risk taking that profits have increased. It's because of income transfer straight out of um, people's wages through inflation into company profits. Um, now, what do you do about that? Not what governments have done, which is to increase interest rates, squeeze people very hard, impose even bigger losses on working people, um, hoping to reduce demand and then to contain um, price increases. Uh, from our perspective, socialist perspective, what should happen is control over prices to minimize the income transfer from workers to capital. Uh, and of course, to intervene on the supply side, to intervene on the side of production, to make sure that the sustained difficulties that are happening over there are overcome from the perspective of workers, not from the perspective of big business. Uh, how we do that, we can discuss uh, as we move along. I don't want to say anything more on this because it sounds like I'm giving you a list of points of what might or might not happen. I want to place it in the context of uh, our broader work which I think will give you, um, you know, more food for thought, um, and then we can discuss it. Now, <laughs> the book out of which this work on inflation has come, the broader book, we call The State of Capitalism, and it's a collective effort. It's not a collected volume, uh, it's a collective effort. 11 of us sat down, put our heads together, and in a coordinated way, uh, produce that uh, output. It's a broad overview of where capitalism stands at the moment, where it is. It brings in uh, uh, different types of knowledge. And we did that because we believe that uh, collective effort is necessary to understand contemporary capitalism. And second, no one really today commands independently sufficient knowledge to be able to write on these things by themselves. Um, the world has become far too complex for that. Um, so that's what we did, and we spent quite a bit of time on it. The spur for it was, of course, the shock of the pandemic. Um, we were, the world was shocked, and so were we in 2020. Um, we observed the state in core countries um, exercising enormous power in 2020, shutting down cities stopping economic life forcing the population to do certain things um and then intervening uh, economically creating money paying people's wages nationalizing the wage bill to a certain extent nationalizing the income statement by supporting big business um and basically managing capitalism for a couple of years inflation was the outcome of that of course eventually, and I'll explain why that is. Uh, but we observed the state do these things and we were taken aback. We thought we had to explain that. We placed that in a broader context, however. We said that what the state did in 2020 looked very much like what it did in 2009, 2008, 2009. And so what we decided to do was to characterize the period from 2008, from the great crisis of 2008 to today, those 15 years. For us, these were similar years in, in terms of how they, uh, how capitalism uh, conducts itself. Uh, we thought we should characterize that entire period. And moreover, we thought that in characterizing it, we should call it an interregnum. An interregnum in the terms of the great Italian Marxist uh, Antonio Gramsci, who used the term, not in the same context, but in a similar one. And by that, what he meant was a state of society in which the old way of doing things becomes untenable. The old cannot continue. The old exhausts itself. But the new cannot be born. The new has got difficulty being born. So society is caught in this interregnum. Society is caught in this in-between state of affairs and it sort of churns over uh, and cannot go forward. To us, 
That's how contemporary capitalism looks. The old way of doing things, which I will sum up in a minute, uh, has clearly exhausted itself. The United States is a prime example of that, and so is Europe. Um, but the new has got difficulty being born. The new has got difficulty uh, emerging. The new, not only from the perspective of working people, but also from the top, from the perspective of the elite. It's the elite also that's caught in that. Um, I'll explain how we think that works. But one last thing I want to say for, is the politics of it. Gramsci said that, gave a classic definition of the interregnum. It's a very powerful idea. What he also stressed was that when you've got a historical interregnum, when society is caught in that situation, the danger is that it will give birth to political monsters. Precisely because society cannot go forward and the old doesn't work, what tends to be born or the, what is in danger of being born out of that is, a, is political monsters. And I think that this is very clear for our time. Um, we are confronted with a threat of political monsters domestically, extreme right-wing fascist uh, outlooks are prevalent now in so many countries, and obviously the, th the threat of war internationally, um, which is sharper, more pronounced than at any other, any other time I can think of. And I remember the Cold War, right? Uh, this is far more dangerous now than the Cold War ever was. So that is a preamble and it's taken me a long time. So I'll sum up and then we can explore uh, the points in detail through discussion because I don't want to lecture you. I want to put some ideas across and then uh, we can discuss it. <clears throat> now, if we look at the interregnum and we try and identify why the old doesn't work, we've got to, to look at, we've got to decide where we're going to look for the old. And obviously the old for us is basically what we might call the core of the existing global capitalist system, the traditional centers of capitalist accumulation across the world, the United States being the prime one, Europe being another one, Japan, uh, and a few other countries across the world, the historic centers of capitalist accumulation. In what way doesn't the core work? Uh, two fundamental ways. The first is that um, on the side of production, on the side of production, um, the supply side that I've already mentioned, we've got the sustained difficulty of accumulation to um, generate rapid growth and to generate high profits. It's remarkable. Um, the decade of the 2010s was the worst in 40 years. This decade is already shaping up to be even worse than that. Um, capitalism needs growth, you see. If it doesn't grow, then uh, it stagnates and rots. Um, there is very little growth at the core. That goes together with weak investment. Private investment has been um, weak in a sustained way for many years across the core. Not in the same way across all countries, but weak. Going together with that is weak um, productivity growth. Capitalism needs productivity growth. That's how it works. It, it invests, capitalists invest, they improve the productivity of labor and they make profits. Um, if there is very little investment, weak investment, and there is weak productivity growth, and obviously profitability suffers. So profitability, from that basic mechanism of capitalism has been weak. The way in which capitalists have been generating profits is through straightforward squeezing of workers. Um, if you can't generate profits by raising productivity in, through investment, then you raise profits by squeezing workers' incomes. And that's what we've seen um, time and time again the last few years. But as you can appreciate, that is not the systematic way of uh, growing and accumulating uh, head. Capital and capitalism must create productivity growth, investment, and so on. And that that's what's been missing on the side of um, accumulation and production. 
uh, sustained weakness in that respect, which has gone together with globalization of production. Um, what has been absent domestically uh, has been present globally. Capital that um, doesn't dynamically produce domestically does dynamically expand globally. Um, and the globalization of productive capital that we've observed the last uh, four decades is without precedent. Uh, capital is international from the beginning, right? The capital is born international. But you've got to appreciate, it's one thing to have um, international trade, another thing to have international finance, quite another to have international production. International production is a very complex thing for capital to, to achieve. And the internationalization of production is a very difficult thing to do. In other words, to produce across borders, beyond borders. We had an enormous expansion of that the last few decades. And the interesting thing is we've had it in new ways in the history of capitalism. And by that, I mean what we've seen is uh, globalization, globalization of production without property rights. That's never, never, never been seen before in the history of capitalism. We are used to seeing big business sending productive capacity abroad which it directly owns and directly controls, subsidiaries of big business across borders. That still exists. But what has grown dramatically the last uh, three decades is producing across borders without necessarily owning the capacity abroad by creating global value chains or global production chains and allowing capitalists across borders to join in this productive network uh, without outright uh, owning their own capacity. They're independent, except that they are not really independent. They belong to the chain and you call the shots as the main um, enterprise from the core. So that's what has been happening on the production side and I'm happy to discuss it further as we move along at the core. The second aspect of the core that is crucial here is of course financialization. Uh, the weakness of accumulation domestically has gone with the growth of finance, tremendous growth of finance, the rise of profit making through financial means, um, the financial practices prevalent among enterprises, uh, productive enterprises, presumably. Uh, this kind of um, development is again without precedent in the history of capitalism. And during the interregnum, what we have seen is a change of it. In what way? Until the great crisis of 2007, 2009, which hit the United States very, very hard, as you, I'm sure you remember, the main agent of financialization were banks. After that, the main agent of financialization became investment funds, uh, hedge funds, non-bank financial institutions, basically portfolio speculators people who buy bonds and shares and make money out of stock market transactions, not banks primarily. Banks are still there, of course, but the main players have become these so-called shadow banks. Um, that shift in financialization has meant two things. First, the dynamism of financialization is less compared to what it was before. Second, the concentration of property rights is without precedent. At the moment, between one quarter and one third of all the equity in the United States, everything in, of the productive sector is in the hands of three funds. It's, 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 it's without precedent. Um, that is the second part uh, of the transformation of the core. So, uh, globalization and, and weak production, financialization, and the shift towards uh, investment funds and so on. The combination is deadly, makes for weak growth, um, weak investment, uh, supply side weakness, and increased exploitation of workers, a squeeze on workers nonstop in order to make uh, profits that way. I can say more about that, but I will leave it at this uh, at this point, so because I want to touch on the 
uh, on the second uh, part of what we did in, in our book. And then we can open it up for discussion. Not much then about the core, the United States being uh, the main element of it, Europe being also trouble, Japan and so on. What is striking about the interregnum, however, is that if the state of the core is in this way, then uh, there's a lot that can be said about the periphery. And one thing we can say is that the interregnum has shown us that core and periphery have re-emerged in a fresh way. Now, core and periphery is a very old distinction that Marxists have drawn about the world economy and obviously associated with imperialism. The core has always been the imperialist center, the commanding heights of the global uh, economy. The periphery have always been, in a sense, the, um, the um, uh, exploited and uh, oppressed and basically downtrodden parts of the globe by the capitalist uh, core. That has been a historic um, distinction that Marxists and others have drawn. And it's very, very important. The interregnum has shown us that such a, such a distinction continues to exist, except that the periphery now uh, is all capitalistic. In the past, in the past, we would think of core and periphery as capitalist core, periphery that was not fully capitalistic, not, not developed enough. There is a distinction like that now. The periphery is historically capitalistic. The distinction that has emerged between core and periphery now is entirely capitalistic throughout the globe. Uh, it is this that has redefined what hegemony means. What is imperialism today? What is the hegemon? Now, we can talk about that for a long time, and we can perhaps best discuss it uh, in, after my, my, my initial presentation. Um, I will make Two points to you here. The hegemon in the world economy today, and obviously I'm thinking of the United States, the hegemon in the in in the in the world economy today, the main imperialist power in the world economy today, achieves that position um, for a number of reasons that come from the economic predominance. The most fundamental among which now are two. The first is the ability of the hegemonic power to set the terms of interaction among globalized capital and globalized finance. The two elements that I've already mentioned about the core, the globalization of finance, the globalization of productive capital, matter also for, the, uh, for understanding core and periphery. Um, the core country, the hegemonic core country, is the, is the country that sets the terms through which these globalized, through which globalized finance and globalized private uh, production, uh, internationalized production uh, operate. It's the it's the country that sets the the, the terms of investment, the term the legal terms of uh, the, the trade transactions, the the weights and measures, and so on. The second thing that sets the hegemon aside is the ability to dictate what the world money would be. The, 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 the money that these internationally functioning units of capital will use in their activities. That is what defines the hegemonic power, and that's what has set the United States aside um, from other powers uh, the last few decades. That's, for us, that's what defines, determines the power of US imperialism. Uh, the last few decades. That's the first point. And I'm happy to discuss it subsequently. The second point that comes to this is, of course, that US hegemony is under pressure now. Uh, it's challenged. What's crucial here is that all the challenges come from the, the periphery. There is not a single challenger to, to US imperial power that comes from the established core. The United States dominates the old core. Uh, and he has subdued all other core powers. I say this, uh, I just want you to understand the significance of it. Historically, Marxists have thought of imperialist contests as contests among powers that come from the core. 
one imperialist fights another. That has been our experience for a century and a half. Um, that model doesn't work in the same way. The challenges to US hegemony right now all come from the periphery. Because the periphery, the way I outlined it to you before, is also itself stratified. It's all capitalistic. It's all become more stratified. And certain independent centers of capitalist accumulation have emerged uh, across it. Uh, they're not all similar or equal to the United States. China is in important ways. Um, Russia is also a serious challenger. Um, um, India is, Brazil is. They basically the BRICS plus a few add-ons um, are the challengers. What they want to achieve, however, is not some kind of non-capitalistic world. And I say this so that we're clear about it. They want to say in how the terms of transacting uh, are determined, and they want to say in world money. That's basically what they're striving for. Um, it's economic competition. It's competition that aims at dominating the world market in that way. And it is probably the most dangerous moment in the world economy since 1914. It's, it's hegemonic contest driven by economic interest. We haven't seen this since the First World War. In this context, in this contest, the United States uh, hasn't got uh, any longer productive predominance. The manufacturing capacity of China is bigger than the manufacturing capacity of all the other, the next five or six countries put together, including the United States. The United States hasn't got trade predominance. It has lost that to China, just if you add inputs and exports, but it definitely has predominance in finance. And he has predominance in using the dollar as world money. That will not go away the, in, the, in the foreseeable future. The main source of U.S. imperial power right now, in economic terms, is, of course, uh, finance and the dollar. Um, and the challenge in economic terms will focus on that. That's where the contest will be in the years ahead. It is from there that the threat of war also arises, because obviously, Imperial predominance, in the end of the day, depends on military power. Um, there, the United States also faces serious challenges. Uh, serious challenges. Uh, its ability to dictate military um, terms across the world is not what it used to be. Um, the threat of war, of war um, is greater than ever. Um, there's a lot more to say about these things, and... I've just touched upon them. I want to finish not on that, though. I want to finish on what the left can and should do. Now, this tremendously difficult situation at the core and globally has arisen at a time when the power of the left and the standing of the left socially in most of the world, um, the developed world anyway, the core countries, uh, is weaker than probably it's ever been. Um, I don't say this because I wish to, you know, frustrate people <laughs> or, or dishearten people. I just say that is a recognition of what we see. Um, you can think, for instance, of the 1930s as another interregnum, when the world as had existed before the First World War had come to an end, but the new world could not be born, and it was born after the Second World War. The 30s could be thought of as an interregnum. The interregnum at that time did give birth to monsters and a world war. But there was a left, you see. There was a very powerful left at that time. And that matters. Today, the left is much weaker. Uh, there are two reasons for that, if you ask me. Um, the first reason is that the left has become cut off from working people. Uh, from the poor and from the oppressed. It has become cut off in a real sense, not in an in, in ideological or intellectual sense. Um, it has become cut off from, the, from those historic uh, links they used to have uh, because the people who um, staff the left come from different classes, uh, speak different language, um, have different habits, 
Um, often, um, the people who call themselves the left um, look down upon working people. Um, uh, they don't belong in the same universe. Um, that is very problematic because the left has historically been the voice of the oppressed, the voice of the poor, um, the voice of the downtrodden. Uh, to do that, you've got to be one of them. Uh, and I don't think that this holds for uh, much of the left across the world. So that's one major source of weakness. Uh, the second reason why the left is weak is, of course, its own ideological confusion. Um, much of what passes for left-wing ideology today is basically identity politics and uh, a kind of normative approach to um, what we do about the world. Um, uh, it, it's not nice to have austerity. It's not nice to 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 uh, to squeeze people's wages. It's not nice to look after the poor. Yeah, I know it's not nice, or it might not, be, or it might or might not be nice. But that's not how the left has operated uh, historically. The left doesn't operate on on a normative basis only. The left operates on a on a on a material and uh, uh, and rational basis of what. Uh, needs doing and seeks to change uh, the class balance and the organizational production. The left today has forgotten that. Um, so if the left is to intervene in the great challenges of the interregnum, if we are to avoid the emergence of monsters ahead, we need to reconnect with our own history. We need to become again integral parts of the poor, the downtrodden, and the workers. And we need to rediscover the radicalism, the historic radicalism of the left, which didn't just put normative arguments across, but argued for the overthrow of social relations that make capitalism. There to think of a non-capitalist world. Um, I suggest that that's what we need to do. Um, I know it's very difficult. Um, I've spoken enough. Uh, and I want to hear what you think from your perspective, from your experiences, uh, from where you are in this common struggle that we're all engaged in. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Uh, well, okay, we'll open it up to questions now. Uh, if anybody wants to ask a question, you can raise your hand or go on stack. Uh, I'll start with one question of my own. Uh, you said at the beginning of your talk, uh, inflation is about um, is a, it's a redistributive uh, process. It's an income transfer between uh, workers and uh, capitalist uh, enterprise owners. And uh, that does sound very Marxist. Uh, it's different from the classic Marxist conception of the wage relation being, the site of struggle uh, between the workers and capitalists. And I'm curious is, do you see, you know, uh, the struggle that you describe in inflation as part of that Marxist picture? And what uh, what bearing do, does Marxian economics have to bear on the topic of inflation to you? For me, it's as Marxist as it comes. Um... And the reason is clear. Um, let me start from the beginning. If you think of an income transfer from the working class to the capitalists or from the poor to the rich, basically, uh, if you think of that, one way of thinking that it takes place is as a kind of speculation or aggressive um, exploitation of particular conditions by enterprises that basically uh, take advantage of monopolistic conditions and squeeze the markets and raise prices uh, uh, exorbitantly. And therefore, they make huge profits. Now, I'm not denying that this happens. Of course. Of course, it happens. So energy businesses made enormous profits the last few uh, years across the world, for instance. Not all energy businesses, but key, key in key positions. So, of course, this happens. But that's not really a good explanation of uh, inflation 
in the last few years. It's not that suddenly capitalists became more capable of pushing prices up and speculating on prices in an upward direction, and therefore they made uh, extraordinary profits. Because if they could do it two years ago, they should be able to do it every year. Um, the explanation of why they were able to do it, some of them, and why did it happen on a on a, on a general basis must be general itself. And there, you've got to look at the structural factors which are summed up for you. The weakness of the production side, sustained weakness of the production side, which has been present for years. Uh, the weak growth that I mentioned before, the weak investment, the weak productivity growth, the, the difficulty of the production side, uh, the supply side, to respond. Um, and then cast your mind back to the pandemic. The pandemic happens, production is even more disrupted because global value chains are, dis are disrupted. The state shuts down entire sectors of the economy, uh, and entire, uh, entire cities. So it disrupts production even more. And then it comes back and boosts demand by giving people money, by supporting, uh, by supporting businesses, by creating money, vast amounts of, uh, uh, of money through the central bank, and therefore boosting demand. Well, if you boost demand, and the supply side is not uh, doing well, prices will tend to rise up. You, you will tend to rise. You create a you create an an upward lift in prices. That's the context in which uh, speculation by enterprises took place. Now, why is that sustained and why is that an income transfer? Because workers' wages don't rise at the same rate, and they don't rise at the same rate because workers haven't got sufficient power to demand across the board that their wages increase in line with prices. They didn't cause the, the increase in prices. The increase in prices came out of boosted demand when supply could not respond. Logic says wages should be rising at the same pace so that everybody's in living standard could be maintained. It's not their fault that this is happening, but that's not taking place. And it's not taking place because in the struggle between capital and labor, labor is weak at this point. So capital can squeeze it. Capital can squeeze it by raising prices, allowing prices to run ahead, not paying workers similar uh, equal uh, wage increases, and pocketing the difference. That is where the income transfer comes from. Um, if real wages do not rise at the same pace, then there's an income loss, and someone puts it in their own pocket or in their own bank account. That's the businesses that do it. Uh, that's the basic mechanism, and that's very Marxist as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there's nothing. Uh, I mean, other other other, other traditions in economics, hetero, heterox, heteros, heterodox traditions in economics, say similar things, but it's also a very Marxist way of looking at that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Sam. Hi, Costas. Thanks for coming to talk to us. Um, at the end of your talk, you mentioned two of the issues that you see as contributing to the weakness of the left as the class composition of left organizations and ideological confusion. Um, class Unity has an article on our website called The Left's Middle Class Problem, in which it suggests that these are, that one causes the other, that the composition, the class composition of the left leads to ideological confusion due to the interests, the conflicting interests of uh, those who constitute left organizations. Um, I wanted to know if you have thoughts on kind of this thesis and, and what you think left organizations can do to address this kind of toxic uh, issue? I think the left should recognize, first of all, the sources of its own weakness. It needs a bit of a forensic exercise. Um, that's the first thing that the left should do. It should engage in a, in a serious discussion as to why the left is weak. Um, I mean, we can always do that, right? And we can always examine our own entrails, and that's not a very good idea. No, I'm not suggesting that we do that. We've got positive things to do. However, there is no question that the left is weak relative to what it needs to do, relative to the challenges in front of it. So what is needed is a forensic exercise, uh, and I suggest that it should happen along the lines that I suggested. Um, now, what what's the connection between the two? What What's the connection between the in a sense, the social or class composition of the left organizations and the left generally and the ideological outlook uh, of the left. You're asking Clearly, me? 
I'm sorry, I cut you off. Yeah, clearly the two are connected. Clearly the two are connected. There's no question. Um, I don't want to engage in a... I don't want to overdo it. You know, they're clearly connected. We're agreed. I don't want to overdo it. I'm more interested in specifying the character of the first and the character of the second, rather than getting into uh, involved arguments about how middle class intellectuals cause the ideological confusion of the left. The important thing is to understand, first of all, that we are cut, much of the left is cut off from the working people because a lot of the left doesn't understand it. People who think of themselves as left who joined the movement in recent years, who don't have the same um, pedigree or traditions, they can't draw on the same past. They don't understand it. They think that the left, being left, is actually to be along these lines. Identity politics, normative uh, statements, uh, moralizing about the world. Um, that's not what the left is about. Of course, there's a moral content to the left. There, of course, there's a moral core. Of course, there is... A, there's a there's a normative dimension. We all want the world to be different, but that's not what defines the left. The left historically has defined itself by its willingness to challenge capitalism directly and to think of how to change the institutions and the order of society. Uh, and to do that, the left has historically looked at the poor, uh, the downtrodden, the workers. Uh, we've forgotten how to do that. Um, and it's not something that can happen by through discussion only. Uh, it's a very difficult and long process. Um, working people don't trust you if you don't look like them. They don't trust you if you don't speak like them. They don't trust you if, you, if you're not there um, to take part in their lives and in their struggles and in their everyday experience. You see, there was a time, certainly in Europe, I know less about the United States. And the United States has always been a bit different. There was a time when you could be of the left or you were of the left and working people would respect you even if they were not left-wing themselves. They would respect you because they, they recognized you as one of them. You see? That's a very, very important thing. It's very important. Even if they don't agree with you. Even if, even if they think that you, your socialist ideas... Um, are a little bit far fetched, right? Um, they would, they still recognize, you know, he, he or she is one of us, right? Um, it is this that we've lost, and that cannot be gained or regained easily. Uh, that takes struggle, takes patience, takes time, uh, and it takes ideas. Uh, we've got to find ways of connecting to the problems that people face and be there um, when they confront them. I know I'm telling you things that you know, or, or things that are um, not easy to do, but I can't see, I can't, there's no shortcut. I don't know if I'm answering you, but that's that's what I would say. You know? No, I appreciate your response. Thank you. Eric, and then uh, Zach and Robert. Uh, hi, Kostas. Thank you for speaking with us today. Um, one of the topics that we've been interested in and recently is just the prevalence in contemporary capitalism of asset manager funds like BlackRock, Blackstone, and the attending prevalence of rent seeking as uh, economic function. So I guess I have two questions related to this. First, what is the role of rent when it comes to inflation compared to, say, price squeezing? And then the second question with regards to uh, the Gramsci quote, are we justified in seeing, given the prevalence of asset manager capitalism, a transition to something like neo-feudalism as a form of social relationship, or is that irresponsible hyperbole? Uh, thank you. Good questions. Um, I did say myself that we've got a shift in financialization, which is how I like to describe that, away from banks or other through a relative diminution of banks, relative diminution of banks compared to uh, investment funds um, and other shadow uh, banking institutions. Now, it's not so much rent. I don't, I don't like stressing the rent I mentioned. From my perspective, I prefer to call it financial expropriation. It's the extraction of profit directly from people's wages, from people's 
money incomes from people's savings. Uh, zero sum games. You take financial profit by taking advantage of someone's um, money savings over the years or by squeezing someone's wages as interest or other payments to finance. This has become very, very important. It's a crucial aspect of financialization um, of the last 40 years. Banks have made big profits out of it. And fund managers are also making big profits out of it. It's a huge part of it, uh, the profit-making um, activities of capitalists, of capitalists the last few years. Um, basically, transacting, profiting through capital gains, um, taking money out of people's income, as I said before, or people's um, money possessions, not capital, but money possessions. As you can immediately appreciate, that is not a process that can sustain itself for very long. That's not the same thing as generating profit out of investments and, uh, and new production and exploiting people through work. This is a this is a this is a uh, a process of making profit out of um, taking someone's income, basically. Financial expropriation. Now, uh, investment funds are the main players today bigger than banks in many important ways. That is, an, that is a very interesting development, as I mentioned. And it also tells you something about the shift in property rights. What is interesting here is that we've got a concentration of property rights uh, in the hands of BlackRock and a couple of other major funds. At the moment, they're not acting as uh, active owners. They're not acting as, uh, they're not intervening as, uh, Capitalist owners who are telling, who are going to tell product, production what to do. Not at the moment. If and when they decide to do that, believe me, you, American capitalism will change, will become transformed enormously. But at the moment, they're not. Um, quite why that is, we need to think more about and we need to discuss. That's the kind of analytics we need, uh, why that is uh, happening in that way. Because it matters for, the, for US capitalism and other uh, capitalisms. Now, does it matter for inflation? Not so much. I don't think that this is what has driven inflation. Um, it's not that kind of financial expropriation or rent extraction, as you called it, um, that explains inflation in the last uh, few years. Here is just straight income transfer uh, into company profits, functioning capitalists, productive capitalist profits uh, through the price mechanism. Um, so I don't think... Um, it's very, very important, but generally, but not for explaining um, inflation, I don't think. So that's the first thing I would say. The second question you asked me uh, had to do with... Well, uh, yeah, just in light of the prevalence of uh, financial capitalism, is there a tendency towards neo-feudalism? Oh, yeah, yeah, neo-feudalism. Yes, yes. I, I, I immediately forgot about it because I don't think there is. <laughs> it's, um, I know there are people who argue... In, techno feudalism or neo feudalism I don't, these are these are not ideas that i find very persuasive they are very the trend that the terms that sound interesting and they promise more than they deliver i don't see i i, I what i see is super capitalism not not neo feudalism uh capitalism is taken many forms uh, uh over its existence uh, the form that it takes today is global, um, internationalized production, which is incredible, globalized production, production across borders without property rights, necessarily, uh, and financialization uh, along the uh, investment fund path. That doesn't look like um, feudalism, to me, feudalism to me. It looks like concentration of economic power in the hands of a few capitalists, and therefore concentration of social power and concentration of political power. Uh, capitalism have always done that. There's nothing democratic about capitalism. There's nothing um, equitable. These are myths of the textbooks. Um, historically, big capitalists have always been autocratic, have always been oligarchic, have always been controlling, but it's capitalistic, it's not feudal. Uh, what allows them to extract these profits is property rights um, and ability to intervene in markets. It's not feudal legal or social 
rights, um, this economic rights. So it is capitalism, uh, very much so, as far as I'm concerned. Zachary? Yeah, thank you so much for speaking to us. I really found it very insightful what you're saying. My question has to do a little bit with kind of like the international trade. And in recent years, honestly, like since Donald Trump, the the slight and I, and I don't I don't want to overemphasize how it shifted, but like it is a, there's been a slight moving away from globalization. And you kind of do see that like in the years since we've been moving away from globalization, there's also been a slight and I don't want to overstate it, but a very slight increase in union militancy and union action and kind of the aggressiveness of labor. Should we not be pining for cutting off more of these relations with other countries? Like we we talk about creating a working class, the left is disconnected from a working class. But one of the real reasons of it is that as the center of the global capitalist imperial like world order in the United States, so many leftists basically work in jobs that are disconnected from production. So would not crashing the US economy by putting up insane tariffs as the Republicans want lead to a stronger workers movement as you know <laughs> workers demand like the as, as workers become or basically forced into productive roles and we cannot just leech off of the low wages of countries like Bangladesh and China and India okay there's okay. a lot there's a lot and all of it is absolutely um topical uh I will answer it in two ways First, in terms of the movement that you've outlined of what we might call reshoring, right? Or bringing back some productive capacity into the United States. And actually, to a certain extent, uh, public, uh, publicly supporting investment. Because the Biden administration, whether we like it or not, has actually given a lot of money to private business for investment purposes, much more than Europe. Europe is a laggard. Uh, I don't think it's a reversal of the trend that I mentioned before. Uh, it's a reflection of that the old cannot continue in the same way as before. Globalization is here with us. It's not, it's not being negated. What's happening is it's lost its dynamism compared to before. And the United States is responding to the challenges to its own imperial position. Uh, and it's showing some imperial nows in contrast to Europe, which hasn't got any that I can detect. Um, so... I think it's basically a rebalancing of positions and a redrawing of relative borders uh, within the core by the United States as a hegemon. Um, and you've got to admire, to a certain extent, the admire. I mean, you know what I mean? In inverted commas, the uh, the, the the U.S. Uh, um, uh, ruling class in this respect, because he has understood that um, he needs to do something about production because it's uh, falling behind clearly relative to China uh, and elsewhere. But the question you're asking me is broader. It's not to do with the, what the options are for the ruling elite. It is to do with working people, the poor and so on in the United States, who are not getting much benefit out of this. Um, my own position is, in some ways echoes what you just said. My own position is that, yes, the left should be arguing for deglobalization. No question. The, the left should be arguing for deglobalization. Um, globalization is uh, is is not um, is not synonymous to international to internationalism in the left way. The left has become very confused on that. You see, there is internationalism of big business and capital, and there's internationalism of workers and the left. That's not they're not the same thing. Uh, and the, the the ideological confusion of the left that I mentioned uh, earlier is also reflected in this regard. Um, much of the left, especially the middle class dimensions of it, have swallowed hook, line, and sinker the uh, big business va variant of internationalism. Um, that's not workers' internationalism. Um, workers and the left are not in favor of um, capital shifting across borders, workers moving in without rights, without trade union rights, without access to housing, without access to uh, education. That is big business internationalism. Um, uh, so deglobalization is what the left should be arguing for 
uh, not not in the sense of shutting people out, but in the sense of producing where you are for the needs of your own community and stop chasing after profit across the far reaches of the globe. Um, so in that regard, yes, and reshoring production and relocalizing production, these are all these are all solid arguments that the left should be putting across, and that would also mean that uh, yeah, the working class would be restrengthened, and there will be productive capacity where, where you are. It's not an easy argument to have, because you can easily shift into the realm of the far right or the alt right. It's not an easy argument. I recognize that, of course. Uh, but since when were socialist arguments easy? Um, uh, you know, uh, and, and you, we've got to strike an independent position between the dominant liberal elite, which is only after profits and so on, and the far right, which is which is poisoning and confusing these arguments, um, as he has always done through history. We are not with either of them. And the left is the, wants an independent position. And as far as I'm concerned, the left is against is, is for deglobalization and definancialization. Um, both of these things. What it means in each country depends on the country, right? The United States is the core of the world economy. It is for U.S. socialists and U.S. working people to work out what it means. It won't mean the same there as it means, I don't know, in Egypt or in France. It is for the Americans to work it out. But uh, that it needs to go in the direction of deglobalization and definancialization, I, for one, am convinced. Well, just to follow up quickly, this is very specifically, I know this is a very contemporary issue, but, you know, Trump is all about raising tariffs. And like when I talk to people of a working class background, that's one of the few like cogent things they like about him. Like they talk about how he killed TPP. They talk about renegotiating NAFTA. And these are not like, you know, a lot of these are overstated. And obviously so many of the Trump tariffs never actually ended up going into place. He'd like threaten tariffs and then three months later, remove them and threaten them again. But should the left be embracing a tariff ideology and actually trying to co-opt that message from the right? No, I don't, no think I, should, I don't think we should be embracing a tariff, ide a tariff ideology. We're not against tax and we're not against, against limiting trade. Let me say that at the beginning. The idea that the left is in favor of free trade is a new one and that baffles me, right? Uh, so the left is not in favor of free trade and, you know, you can trade whatever you like. No, we are in favor of controlling trade and we're in favor of, of course, exchanging. But as we're in favor of a controlling economic life generally, we're also in favor of controlling trade. Historically, that's what the left has always uh, done. Now, that doesn't mean that we side with Trump when it comes to uh, to tariffs. We recognize that he's putting his finger on something real. We recognize that. Yes, he's putting his finger on something, and then he's Trumpifying it, which he tends to do. Um, so we need an independent position in this for the Americans to work it out, what it means in practice to uh, to to bring back production and ensure that production takes place uh, locally and where people live and they need the jobs. Um, and if that means directing and managing trade, then so be it. We direct and manage trade. Uh, if that means that some trade requires price controls and tax controls, then we do so. Um, am I making myself clear? I mean, I, you know. It, 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 yeah, no, thank you so much. I don't want to take time from anyone else. Thank you so much for answering that. Thank you. Robert. Yeah, uh, thanks, Kostas. Uh, just two quick questions, uh, a brief theoretical question and then a brief uh, practical question. The theoretical question is why it would be uh, that certain changes to the forms of finance and production that you cite would lead to changes or amount to changes in the functions of finance and production uh, that you cited. For example, the move from dominance by Wells Fargo or J.P. Morgan Chase to dominance by BlackRock and other private equity funds is a change in the form uh, of finance, but it doesn't seem to me that there would necessarily be, and in fact, I don't even see any change in the function in the sense that, you know, JP Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo were never more dynamic when it came to production than is BlackRock or any other PE fund uh, today. Similarly, when it comes to you know, global production chains, sure, less reliance on property rights, um, but if the same party that in the past would have had the property rights now has what we can call network power and has control of the chain 
by some other means, be it by contract or by initiative or whatever, it would seem to me again that there wouldn't be any change in the functions of global production uh, production um, simply because there's been a change in, in the form that the power takes, right, from property rights to network power. Um, the practical question has to do with um, this vexed and time-tested uh, question of how the left can indeed engage with labor uh, and with the, the working class, at least those who are at the so-called vanguard, right? So this, is, of course, is a very old problem. I mean, the Narodniki, who sort of preceded the Bolsheviks in Russia in the, in the 1880s, um, went out to live among the peasants in order to sort of get to know the people they were working on behalf of. And the peasants found them, you know, well-meaning, but also found them to be quite foolish and comical, right? And this is one reason, I think, that ultimately somebody like Lenin had to say, well, we might as well just own the fact that there has to be a vanguard. Um, on the other hand, you do have counterexamples. Um, for example, in the, the Wobbly movement, right, the IWW, a guy like Bill Big Haywood, or, sorry, Big Bill Haywood um, was not exactly an intellectual, but he was at least, you know, uh, thoughtful enough and, and bright enough and well-read enough that he could be simultaneously uh, of the people on the one hand and yet a leader among the people on the other. What do we have to do to replicate something more like that? And if we can't do that, are we stuck with basically just owning the fact that there has to be a vanguard and we're sort of part of it? Uh, have you got any easy questions? <laughs> <laughs> um... Maybe I'll just have to read more. Um, but. <laughs> um, right. Let me start with the first one, and then I'll come to the second one, which sounds more manageable, but it's actually more difficult. Um, <laughs> the first one, you're right that it is to a large extent a change in form, but the change in form also matters. Uh, it, 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 it very often goes with change in conduct. Let me let, let me not call it uh, uh, content, but conduct, right, underneath. And that is, that is important. You see, um, an investment fund is a portfolio manager. Uh, doesn't create money. Doesn't, doesn't lend directly. It buys assets. It buys paper. And it manages the portfolio. And then it might buy, uh, uh, might buy derivatives and it might go into the repo market to protect itself uh, against the risk, uh, to, create, to, give, to give itself the liquidity to, to, to buy the assets and go into the, the, the derivatives market to lock in the value of the portfolio uh, and act as a portfolio player and draw the profits through asset price movements. A bank does that but it does more than that. A bank lends money to, to directly to those who invest it. A bank creates money. It is a financial institution, for sure, but it does more things than uh, a fund does. The shift matters. It matters for how money is created. It matters for how uh, productive activity goes on and for how capitalists obtain credit. Um, I don't want to get too technical. I don't want to go into deep into this stuff, but... Uh, a crucial thing in the operations of finance connected to this, this point that you raised has to do with how the central bank works as well. And we know that the contemporary central bank uh, is a giant. It's bigger than ever. That is the, the, the most prominent characteristic of the interregnum. Uh, it's a public bank. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. It's a public bank. It pretends that it's not by it is. It's, a, it's, an, it's an arm of the state. It sits in the middle of the financial system. And it dictates terms by creating fiat money, huge amounts of fiat money. Mm -hmm. uh, and that allows the shadow banks to continue to exist and it and gives the central bank a way of operating, which allows us the, 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 the shadow banks to continue to exist. These are very important dimensions, you see. So it isn't just a change of form. It is to do with how capitalism ticks over and where profits come from. Right. How it's true, but it's it's also true, of course, at least in the U.S., that the Fed uh, has effectively replicated the relations that it used to have only to the commercial banks with a lot of the so-called shadow banks. Indeed, there seems to be a dialectic here that every time there's a crisis that comes about because of shadow banking, the Fed simply incorporates the shadow banks into its orbit and basically makes them more or less functionally equivalent to what used to be the domain only of the commercial banks. Right. But the but the shadow banks still do not make um, uh, direct loans and still do not create money, whereas the private banks do. 
Uh, now I'm not drawing I'm not drawing any big distinction between active capitalists and who are supposedly good and financial mm -hmm. capitalists who are supposedly bad. That doesn't hold. They go together, right? However, the the transformation in the way in which they operate matters. So mm -hmm. and it matters for the overall taking over of uh, contemporary capitalism. That's why the change of form is also uh, very important in this regard. Similarly, for the uh, the the movement of productive capital across borders. You see, it's one thing for Ford to have productive capacity in Britain, establish a big plant at Dagenham in outside London, own, own it uh, directly, tell it what to do, integrate it into the Ford structure and work it in that way. And plenty of, plenty of multinationals still do that. Quite another uh, to control an independent producer of cars or an independent producer of car seats or an independent producer of car tires or whatever it is in Turkey or whatever it is, whom you integrate mm. into your production network in a variety of financial ways, technology ways, um, price setting ways. This is a very different way of operating and it allows you as the controlling uh, enterprise to behave differently. Mm. Lessons you need for investment allows you to, to 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 split your profits and send them back to your shareholders more easily um allows the turks tanzanians whoever else you are integrating into your into your network to begin to do things differently in their own places you see these are very different capitalism that emerges uh, so it's very very important to take that into account for to, to, to understand the overall um performance and that's what i was hinting at um now, on the difficult question, then, <laughs> I, wish, I wish I knew the answer. Or I wish there, w there was an easy answer. Certainly, I'm not advocating things that um, the sectarian parts of the left or parts of the left historically have done, which is we've got to become like workers, we've got to go into the factories. And I'm not saying that. This has been tried. This is nonsense, right? Um, we are what we are. We've got jobs. We do our, lead our lives the way we we lead them, and we do our best, the best we can individually where we are. Uh, to become like workers, it doesn't mean that you've got to become a worker yourself. It means that you've got to persuade and recruit among workers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or the poor, or whoever. You've got to be there for that. You can't live. In a, you can't. You can't live a life of exclusion and be up there and expect to share the uh, the experience. Of you can't. But you don't. You don't, you don't have to become like the poor and like the downtrodden and live in the same conditions exactly. But you've got to be near. You've got to be near them. You've got to be seen to be there. Uh, you've got to be seen to be taking part in their activities. They will mistrust you to begin with, for sure. Why would they? If you've got more money than people do, if you come from a different. If you've got different life experiences, if you've got two degrees and they've got none, then you're not going to be trusted, you know. Um, I see no other way of doing it. Um, I see, I, I, you know, I, I see it in Greece, which is where I interact in politics. I see it in Britain. I see it in other parts of Europe. I see no reason to assume they will be different in the United States. I mean, I, I lived in the United States in 22 for six months in, in, in New York, and I saw it firsthand. I mean... You've got to be near the poor. Um, and then, then you've got to wait. You've got to be there for some time before they trust you, if they if they ever will. I see. No, I've got no other answer to give you. Um, unfortunately, we've let it slip. Unfortunately, we've become cut off. Um, we need to regain it. Uh, it won't be easy. Thanks, <laughs> uh, Mark. Are you still there to ask your question? He, he can't talk. He sent me the questions to ask for him. Um, two questions for our member, Mark. Uh, the first is, you spoke of the importance of looking and talking like working class people. How is this not a form of identity politics? And the second question is, what makes somebody working class? I'm asking because here in the US, many college educated white collar workers make less than blue collar workers. The second point in some ways is easier to answer. I mean, one of the when it comes to class, one of the biggest confusions that I am aware of is what American people think is middle class. 
I mean, whenever you hear Americans talk about middle class, <laughs> really, are you middle class? You know, if you if you consider it fully, you know, it's obviously an ideological outcome. It's obviously you know people think that they're middle class when they manifestly are not, uh, and it's easy to it's easy to 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 operate under that uh, um, confusion. So, um, the second point, in many ways. You know, um, uh, I don't want to define the working class in sociological terms. I don't want to describe it. This is it. And if you're outside that, you, you know, that's not the way to go about it. Uh, the working class and the poor are a little bit like a camel, you know. W what's a camel? You can't describe it. But if you see it, you know it, right? So, uh, so uh, it's a little bit like that, right? Uh, we all know what it how what it means to be more working class why i mean not to be working class don't ask me to define it uh, so um but you do know what it means in practice when, especially when you're engaged in 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 actual politics um identity politics is more difficult to deal with as an idea i'm not against identity per se i'm not uh, or stressing the importance of identity or learning from it i'm not against that um the, I mean, human beings operate on the basis of identity and the biggest revolutionary struggles have always been about identity always religious identity national identity these are also identities i know people don't like to talk about them those who believe in uh, identity politics but these are very powerful identities right um being working class is not so much an identity right being working class is a social is a social definition is a social characterization um so I'm not necessarily against uh, discussing identity politics uh, generally or saying that identity politics is important or that certain types of identity are crucial for understanding class struggle. Of course, of course. Um, when I say that identity politics has been a problem, you know very well what I mean. I mean, it, it is the kind of politics that shies away from, in a sense, um, social structures and their important, the key role of agents, social agents and how they interact and looks at um, personal dimensions, what personally defines you. And even there, it's very selective. It's very selective. It doesn't, it talks about identity, but it doesn't look at everything. Some identities are bad, so we leave them outside, you know. Um, it's that kind of politics. I think it's a dead end. Uh, the United States is in my judgment, is replete with it. Um, it's astonishing, uh, very, very powerful presence of that kind of politics. You know, racial identity, gender identity, sexual identity um, is very incredibly powerful in the United States. Um, and I don't think it's particularly productive. Um, of course, it must be there, of course, but it's become enormously enormously powerful and enormously predominant. And I don't think that's very healthy. Um, how you break out of that, I don't envy you living in the in, in US society, but it must be, you need to bring some other dimensions to it. You need to broaden it out that, you know, class is also very important, you know. I, I'm, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but, you know, I'm speaking as an outsider and as someone who has experienced the U.S. society repeatedly over the years. So, you know, um, I don't have the magic key. <laughs> uh, Daniel? Sure. Thank you very much. I, I want to ask you two questions to get your perspective on things which you brought up in your uh, opening remarks. Um, the first one, so just about sort of perspective, you know, possibilities as you see them. The first one is about uh, what you think the possibilities are for BRICS, in particular China, like what the future might hold as far as developments uh, go there. Um, these are all sort of closely related. And similarly, for the EU, I'm reading things like you know, German German capitalism might be finished because it's lost cheap Russian gas and it's lost its export markets. And so, you know, there are things to worry about in Europe. Um, so I was curious, you know, BRICS, particularly China and EU, particularly Germany, 
what does the future look like there from your perspective, especially, you know, in the context of all these problems you've been talking about? Okay. And then the other one, you mentioned the role of the dollar as the global reserve currency and dollar hegemony, uh, the dollar system, um, deficit spending abroad and recycling into bonds, this whole sort of military industrial money laundering thing. There's a lot to say about that, but um, people are also talking about de-dollarization. It seems like more recently than in the past. And so I was wondering, what is your perspective on on the, the future of the dollar and the possibility of de-dollarization? So thanks again, by the way. Okay. We do deal with these things in our book to a certain extent, um, actually quite extensively. Um, let me say a couple of things on China. Chinese capitalism is obviously the capitalist triumph of the last 40 years. Um, it's been a creation of the state, very clearly. And it remains pivoting on the state. And the role of the Chinese state is very different to the role of the US state and the European state because the power of the Chinese state doesn't only come from command of the money, which is what happens at the core countries of the world economy. It certainly, they certainly control money in China, the state does, but it's, it's, its power also comes from direct ownership of uh, productive resources and uh, from a range of controls of um, uh, economic activity generally. Um, but the, the easy days of Chinese uh, uh, capitalism are gone. Um, returns to capital have declined. They've been declining for some time. The Chinese call it the new normal. It's an exhaustion of um, easy returns. And clearly the business model that they've used, if you th think of the countries using a business model, uh, has been exhausted. Um, however, they're caught in it. Um, investment is still 45% of GDP which is enormous. Um, the returns to investment are problematic. Um, they can still survive. They can still do well by mobilizing new layers of workers, particularly people from in certain regions of the country where wages are still low relative to the main metropolitan centers. Uh, but that has limits um, too. So China faces great problems in terms of the accumulation of capital uh, domestically, which are manifest. All you've got to do is uh, look at the look at the predictions and the forecasts and the actual um, outcomes. Can they change it? Not easy. People say they need to change the shift of uh, aggregate demand away from investment towards consumption. Yes, of course they do. You try and do that. Because that that implies social transformation, profound social transformation. Um, it's not easy. I don't think the Communist Party of China um, can contemplate that. Um, China also has enormous problems with regard to um, its financial system, which is not financialized, but it's enormous. Um, and um, it continues to create problems with through banks in the shadows, not shadow banks in the same sense that we've got them in the United States, but banks in the shadow. Um, in other words, operating outside the regulation. That that also needs to be controlled because obviously it affects real estate and so on. So these are real problems that Chinese accumulation faces, and they're not um, they're not going to be uh, resolved quickly. I see no easy way out. Nor do I see the rise of private capitalism in China. There was a there was talk. I mean, the rise of private capitalism as capitalism that can suppress the state. There was talk, particularly from U.S. sources uh, 10, 15 years ago, as capitalism expands, you will see the growth of a domestic private capitalist class, and that will squeeze the the, the capitalist, the, the state-based capitalist class uh, into a corner, and then, then they will become like us. Um, no. Um, there is an interpenetration of state based capital and private capital, which is, they, they're inextricably linked. More likely it is that um, big 
players in state-operated enterprises will become more independent. Um, those who command the large petroleum enterprises, for instance, or the large uh, chemicals and others in China, uh, the state, the state um, uh, functionaries that command those, who are all, who, all of them are Communist Party members, um, have got enormous power and enormous um, uh, economic power as well. I see tendency towards greater emergence of these islands uh, within the Chinese economy. What that would lead to, I'm not sure, because these people want to, to become, they want to become more autonomous. Um, still on connect to the state. What it would mean, I don't know. Nobody does. Um, but this this is also uh, a major uh, challenge. The last thing which allows me to talk about de-dollarization, then I'll tell you about the EU, is of course the financial dimension. China, as we know, is far ahead of the United States when it comes to manufacturing uh, and becoming technologically uh, proficient, more and more technologically proficient as well. Um, it has exceeded the, the, the presence of the United States in trade as well globally. In finance, it's way behind. And there is no real prospect of the NMB replacing the dollar. Those who those who think that de-dollarization has started uh, are, are, are moving rather too fast. Um, there is no evidence that the dollar is actually significantly losing its position as the main reserve currency. It, the retreat, the decline of its share in uh, global reserves is, is real, but it's only of the nature of three or four percentage points over the last 10 years. We're not talking about some kind of contraction from 60 to 20. You see what I mean? Um, and that retreat of the dollar has not been taken over by China. Um, it's rather a, a range of other small currencies, smaller currencies that have increased their share. The yen, um, the British pound, the, the Swiss franc, they've increased their share from 3% to 4%, that kind of thing. Um, that has to do with the global finance, which I haven't got time to go into, but to come to China, the renminbi is not really in the game at the moment. And the reason why the renminbi is not, the reasons why the renminbi is not in the game tells you something about the dollar. Why, why can't China do it if it dominates man in manufacturing and it, it also is very strong in trade? Well, I'll give you three reasons. The first, its banking system is, is state controlled, publicly owned. That doesn't create good conditions for private owners of capital to shift their money into, into China and to begin to operate openly in the, the Chinese financial markets. Second, the capital account is heavily controlled. You can't move money in and out of China freely the way you do it in the United States. Therefore, the market is not deep and, 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 and liquid in the way in which it is in the United States. And you need one of those if you're going to have the world money, uh, if you're going to be the issue of the world money. And third and very important factor, Chinese banks and Chinese big businesses are heavily exposed to the dollar. How do you think Chinese big businesses work internationally? Were they in Mimbi? No, no, they work with the dollar. And Chinese banks also work with the dollar. Uh, these Chinese um, agents are exposed to the dollar enormously. So China has got vast reserves of dollars, for sure, but it also has vast exposure to the dollar. China needs dollar liquidity. And uh, how we will manage that ahead, I don't know. But that's no basis on which to, ad to advocate the global use of the renminbi. Um, gonna, you're not going to persuade very many Filipino capitalists um, to keep their money in that. One thing that might change things, one development that might change things is, of course, central bank digital currencies. That's possible if the Chinese begin to create a kind of a kind of distributed ledger-based renminbi, then it's possible that that might start acting as some kind of world currency. But we're a long way from that, right? We're a long way from that. So that would be my answer with regard to that. As for the EU, the EU is a basket case. Uh, it's the weakest part of the global economy. It's a disaster. It's a disaster economically. It's a disaster politically. It's a disaster socially. If these are the the heirs of the great European imperialists, then let's all have a laugh. You know, uh, I mean, it's beyond description, really. And as for the Germans, I've never known the like. I mean, 
Germany succeeded in the way in which he has done for two key reasons. First of all, wage freeze. They froze the wages of German workers for two decades, from the middle of the 90s to the middle of the uh, 2010s. Mostly to the, almost two decades, not quite, but almost two decades. Second, cheap energy from Russia. Technologically, Germany is not, not in the game. It's not in the game. In terms of the new cutting edge uh, industries, it doesn't exist. It doesn't compete. Germany's cars, chemicals, and machine tools. Without cheap energy and without a wage freeze, what are they going to do? And here you see the complete bizarre nature of the European ruling elites. The Germans themselves decided to shoot themselves in both feet. There's no way that the American ruling class would have done that. No way. Uh, the Germans did. And that tells you something about uh, the rest of the, imperial, the old imperialists at the core. No challenge to the Americans. No, no ability to challenge, to stand up to them. Nothing. Uh, so Europe is in deep trouble. I see no evidence that it's going to take an active path. I mean, I can I can tell more about. It. I can say more about it, but we haven't got time. Um, and it is it's in grave danger of far right fascist movements emerging from one end of the continent to the other. Um, Europe is the weak link right now. Uh, do you have time, Costa, for uh, two more questions? Uh, I've, got some, I've got some friends that come to see me, but I'll take two more questions. Okay, okay. And then, or well, maybe just one more question. Um, you mentioned in your in your pamphlet, um, or you sort of proposed that the workers' movement would be wise to ally with small businesses who are also hurt by inflation and. You know, the talk you gave just now and all the questions, you know, gives me the impression that, you know, small business owners are a pretty different species from um, global corporate capitalists. Um, and uh, there might be a tendency in the left to uh, avoid avoid working with businesses as seeing them as a as a, you know, a different class and like opposed to the interests of workers. Uh, but there are also, um, uh, uh, I think a big, a big part of the left is uh, more than willing to work in coalition with um, with small businesses. But what do you think? I mean, can you elaborate on why you think um, small businesses happen to have um, similar interests to the working class in this instance and why it would be uh, wise to ally with them politically over this issue? I mean, in the case of inflation, it's pretty clear. Uh, small businesses have not had the same capacity as big businesses to raise their output prices and therefore to benefit from inflation. In fact, uh, they have felt some of the pressures that workers have also felt, not being able to raise their own output prices if they were inputs into big business production. Um, Capital is not equally powerful, right? So there is constant tussle between various components of it. So uh, the case of inflation shows you um, how that can uh, pan out. But it's of course broader. I mean, this is the this is really the age of big business. I mean, keep, people keep talking about it, competitions, and this is this is the age of big business. Giant formations of capital dictate the paths of the world economy. In this context, small enterprises and small businesses um, suffer a lot of pressures. Um, you can see it in finance. There's a persistent credit gap that um, uh, you find in many countries. Difficulty of obtaining credit to engage in the basic uh, activities that you want to engage. Um, there's pressure from your from those big businesses that buy your goods and so on. There's pressure from government that doesn't really meet your needs, depending on the sector in which you operate, because it, there's policy capture by big business. Um, so there is no natural alliance between small business and workers. I'm not advocating that for a minute. But what I'm saying is, confronted by the pressures of the interregnum, confronted by the 
aggressive, exploitative big capital, we need an alliance. We need a social alliance and a, and a, and a social front that uh, that will change the terms of reference. If the working class was powerful enough and, and socialist and left-wing ideology was powerful enough, I would say we would be the leaders and others, but we're not, right? So, so we need to find messages and ideas that would allow for a broad front to be formed against big business right now, which, and I mean big finance as well as big uh, trading and production, which is the main problem of the age. Um, and I think there is plenty of scope. Um, the middle class in the United States or the middle of the income distribution is taken an enormous knock um, the last few decades. Um, everybody talks about small business, but I wouldn't like to be engaging in one uh, in the United States. So we need to be thinking of policies and practical, concrete uh, proposals that will generate broad fronts. Uh, I don't see any other way in which we can become relevant again. Um, that's what I would say. Uh, we'll end it there. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Costa, for, for your talk. It's been very informative. I'm sure everyone would agree. Um, is there any, are, are there any th final thoughts you'd like to uh, uh, end on? Uh, uh, can people find you anywhere? Uh, I mean, you've got my details. I'd be happy to talk to any and all of you again in, in the future. I, I'm i glad we've uh, had this opportunity to exchange ideas. Um, I respect greatly what you do. Long may you continue to do that. Um, it's interesting that in the United States, um, there is more intellectual life than there is in Europe at the moment. Um, it is easier to talk about socialism in the United States than it is in Europe. Um, and I, I never thought I'd see that in my lifetime, but here it is. Um, so it's very, very important. I know you've got a lot on your plate and I know you've got uh, big beasts facing you. I wouldn't like to be in your shoes in this regard, but there you are. You live where you live and you are what you are. So uh, you, have to, you have to confront your own monsters. Uh, but I'm you know, if I can communicate with you, if I can, if we can interact, if we can share ideas, I'd be delighted to do so in a comradely and, um, you know, fraternal way. Thank you well, so much. We would definitely, yeah, we would definitely love to have you on back. Right. Thank you, and thank you to everyone. Thanks very much.